Hi everybody, this is being recorded in part uh, to say sorry for Portsmouth BFN study day that I haven't been able to go ahead with that. This is the presentation that I was going to deliver then, uh, but also something that I've been intending to record for a very long time. Many of you know that I actually have um, inflammatory bowel disease myself. I was first diagnosed when I was 22 years of age after a year or so of symptoms. So it's something that's very close to my heart and has affected a large part of my life. Um, I've had three children since I had it and, and so I've now had it for 40 odd years. Um, so I've learned quite a lot on the way. But one of the things that is important is that it affects a lot of women who are of childbearing age, may be pregnant or may be breastfeeding. And that produces its own problems uh, in itself. Are the drugs safe to be taken? How do you cope with the symptoms? How do you how do you how do you just live? How do you survive with this condition? So there are two types of inflammatory bowel disease. One is called Crohn's disease, which is what I have, and the other is called ulcerative colitis, and they are slightly different. The incidence of, in, of the two conditions, Crohn's affects sixty thousand people in the UK. Uh, it's about one in three thousand, one in a thousand and there are three to 6,000 new cases every year. And the pink peak incidence is in 18 to 30 year olds. Colitis has 120,000 people in the UK, incidence of one in 500, and there are six to 12,000, so it's twice as common. There is a genetic link so those of us who have it are more likely to have a relative with symptoms um, or sometimes it seems that, that relatives have had symptoms but never had it actually diagnosed. It's kind of really only started to be diagnosed much after the Second World War. Eisenhower um, had symptoms all through the um, Second World War when he was managing um, everything that commanders of America have to do during the war. So there's a higher chance of developing it if you have a relative who has it. So those of us who have it would do anything that we possibly can to protect our children from having it. But strangely, only 45% of identical twins will both suffer from it. And I use the word suffer because it isn't an easy condition to live with. There's lots of things that they have suggested um, have caused it, but nobody really knows um, exactly what the cause is. It's an autoimmune disease, so it is the body attacking itself. Some people have said it's uh, down to have had antibiotics in the first year, but many, many people have antibiotics in the first year and don't have it. There was the classic thing about it was linked with um, measles. Now, I happen to have me measles very early on, so that kind of makes a sense. But probably it's just a strange reaction to something that we've encountered. I can trace my symptoms back very clearly to a bug that um, went round Portsmouth in 1973. And it was a very, very hot summer and everybody was off school and university with chronic sickness and diarrhea. You went to the pharmacies and you couldn't get anything to treat sickness and diarrhea. And it had exactly the same symptoms for me, but they never really went away. But it took another three years for me to actually be diagnosed with, with the, the actual condition itself. So the symptoms are predominantly chronic, urgent and often bloody diarrhea. Um, but when we think about diarrhoea, when we have it just as an acute one, it's an inconvenience for a few days. When I'm talking about diarrhoea with inflammatory bowel disease, it's not being able to go out anywhere without being aware of where the nearest toilet is. Um, some people 
have stress incontinence. So even lifting a child up can cause you to lose control over your bowels. And that's incredibly soul destroying. Um, so it can affect how we live our lives. There is a lot of pain. For me, I had spasmodic pain um, every time I ate, drank or thought about food. So some people lose lots of weight because they will avoid eating uh, to avoid pain that goes with it. I actually gained weight, partly because I was on very high doses of steroids at the time, but I worked on the fact of if it was going to hurt anyway, I might as well just keep it eating and then hopefully it would stay away. But all of my clothes were marked on the lower right hand side where I would permanently have my hand resting against my side. But most people will lose lots of weight. There's also incredible tiredness because you are losing all of your nutrition straight through your body. But also it can affect other parts of our body. There are people who have problems with their eyes, their skin, their joints and their liver. It isn't just in the gut. So when I talk about living with IBD, if you're unfortunate enough to develop it as a child, which many people do, it affects growth and it affects education because you may actually not be able to attend school all of the time. It affects relationships. It's not much fun to be dating somebody if you need to think, where is the nearest toilet? Um, I'm, I'm in pain, I don't want to go out tonight. Uh, it's, it's difficult, you need a very understanding partnership. It is said to increase fertility and when um, I was in my 20s with mine, the understanding was that actually sex in itself was painful because of pressure against your gut. So that's why it affected fertility. If you don't do it, you don't get pregnant. Um, and it also increases the risk of miscarriage. It actually affects every aspect of life. And 25% of girls and young women will conceive after their diagnosis. I will be sharing all the slides that I'm talking to on my uh, website breastfeedingandmedication.co.uk later on. But I want to read you um, a quote from some somebody when I asked, what do you want me to say to people if I do this talk? And this lady said, I was 23 when I was diagnosed. I managed to burn out during university and got sick shortly afterwards. It's had a dramatic effect on my life, mostly as many years I didn't dare take on a stressful job with long hours as whatever I did I got really ill, which for a Cambridge graduate takes a lot out a lot of options. So I gradually learned to appreciate life outside of being a high flyer and taught myself to be more laid back. Throughout my 20s I flared almost every three months and required steroids to get it back under control. So my partner and I decided that if I stayed healthy for six months and we both had secure jobs, then we'd try for a baby. In April 2010, I fell pregnant immediately. IBD is probably the reason that I actually got involved with breastfeeding in the first place, because the time when I was most well was when I was pregnant or I was breastfeeding. Each time I stopped breastfeeding, the symptoms came back really quickly. So between my first and my second children, um, I was really poorly and spent most of my time going in and out of hospital um, with my mum having to come and, and look after my eldest daughter. So for me, I had a bowel resection um, in 1977. And that required a piece of my gut to be taken out and the two ends, healthy ends joined back together again. Um, I'm never ever going to wear a bikini again, but I also had to sign consent forms to say that I would have a colostomy if necessary. Now a colostomy is a hole in your side which is then attaches to a bag which collects all your bowel motions. And back in those days, as a pharmacist, I knew all about what colostomy bags looked like. And they were made of pure rubber 
and they smelt horrible and they were bulky and just quite disgusting and I f said very very seriously if that is what happens to me when I wake up I will commit suicide because I'd been married for two years I didn't want my life to be like that but as I came round from the anaesthetic all I could hear them say was that's what she didn't want isn't it and I was devastated because I took that to mean that um, I'd got a colostomy Actually, what it meant was that I'd got a nasogastric tube in to stop me being sick. Um, before you have the operation, you should clear your bowel out completely because obviously they don't want to be cutting in it if stuff's going to be appearing infections. But to do that, they'd passed a nasogastric tube and were passing laxatives through every hour. But I choked in the night and it, and it sort of retched up in, in my throat and I thought I was choking. Um, and I had a, a complete panic attack and said, either you take this out or I will. Um, but in the process, then instead I got sort of stirrup pump enemas. So I don't know which was worse. And I had to have a second resection after the first birth just because there was so much scar tissue. It's really difficult when they do bowel operations to know whether they've got enough out so that all the diseased area has gone or whether they've taken too much or, or there's too much scar tissue so most people end up with at least two um, operations. So where are we with the role of breast milk? There is a study um, in 1979 where Warwell studied 57 patients um, and he found that 29.8 of them had been percent of them had been formula fed compared with 11.8 percent of matched controls so there was more than twice a risk of developing the condition if you um, were formula fed instead of being breastfed i was breastfed i still got it and we think that possibly um, some kind of a pathogenic infection comes out as IBD later on. So if you think about the formula milk being that um, unnatural foreign protein that's affecting your gut and if you're formula fed from birth passing out through the, the cell walls and not having the protection of breast milk that wouldn't explain why there is some some risk. The other thing that I've said uh, would say was everybody that I've ever met with IBD is a bit of a perfectionist. We all work way too hard. Just in the story of the mum, she was a Cambridge graduate. She knows she'd burnt out at university. Um, enough is never enough. We always have to keep going a little bit longer. Um, but. That in itself brings a problem when we look at medication if we're breastfeeding. We want to know that we're protecting our babies and we want to know that we're doing everything that we possibly can. So often one of us will try not to take drugs and carry on being unwell rather than risk damaging. And sadly, there are some professionals who don't know very much about the way the drugs get into breast milk and will say, um, if you formula feed, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, the risk of the drug is too great. And it's one of the reasons that I actually set up a Facebook page called Breastfeeding with IBD, which has now got well over a thousand members from all different parts of the world, where we can share information with each other. Um, and I post loads of stuff about which drugs are safe and which aren't safe that we can take back um, to the professionals. There's a lovely story on there this week um, where a mum needed a new drug and was told by her nurse absolutely wasn't going to happen if she was breastfeeding. Um, she had to stop um, and the only concession was made that she had to talk to the consultant rather than the specialist nurse. But when the doctor was shown all of the information he was absolutely amazing and said, you've shown me stuff that I didn't know before. This really does make a difference. Um, yes, of course, I can now understand that this is an OK drug for you to breastfeed on um, and I'll support you. And also I will share this with my colleagues and also will change my practice. 
and as a practitioner I, I want to clone him because I want him to be around and to be a leader to say to other people please let's think about all of these aspects of our lives we're women with a condition and we need medication but we're doing the very best we can to protect our babies Crohn's disease affects just a short length of the gut but it causes inflammation of the gut right through the gut wall whereas colitis can go anywhere along the length and we have a very long length of gut but it only affects just the inside lining so it's a more extensive one so people with colitis tend to have to have their whole gut removed rather than portions which is an option for people with uh, Crohn's um, because it's so difficult to remove a bit so it literally can go anywhere from your mouth to your anus and some people are able to manage with um, suppositories and enemas as a way of protecting their gut the kind of drugs that we need usually mean that we need to have regular blood tests but actually we know an awful lot about these drugs if we've got a th over a thousand people on our page and that number is going up every week there are an awful lot more people out there um, who do need treatment so the first course of treatment is usually steroids to produce a stop the inflammation steroids worry women because we think of them more like kind of anabolic steroids and they're going to affect the baby and they're going to make him grow big muscles or feminize a girl or something like that actually we use up to 40 milligrams very regularly we can use higher doses short term if you use them for too long they produce quite a lot of side effects so you'll get like hamster pouch cheek cheeks you get a hump on the back of your neck and one of the side effects is that you get bone thinning thinning so a lot of us will have a degree of osteoporosis later on in life um, I'm just having that battle at the moment uh, having had a bone density scan recently will I need medication the next drug that we take is mesalazine and that again is widely used but some babies will develop um, diarrhea and may pass blood in, in their poo but that doesn't mean that we actually have to stop breastfeeding what we need means is we need to think about whether that drug is the right drug to be given um, or whether one of the other drugs is safer the next strongest one we usually go to is something called azathioprine which is an immunosuppressant so it's stopping the autoimmune disease stopping our bodies reacting in the same way and it stops us needing um, doses of steroids and that in part is why I'm not at a study day today because I take azathioprine and I'm immunocompromised so if coronavirus comes round although I'm at no greater risk of contracting it I am at a greater risk of having adverse effects because of it um, and I kind of really don't want to end up in hospital so all of us are a little bit touchy at the moment and then there are a variety of biological drugs that are given by injection or infusion things like infliximab, Humira um, which we know a lot about and the molecules in, of these drugs are so large that they can't get into breast milk it's like having a huge Lego brick and trying to push it through a brick wall it, it just won't go through the pores in the cells which means that no matter how much gets into breast milk the baby can't absorb any of it it also means with all all of these drugs that the babies are not actually immunocompromised because they're not getting the drug and that's something that often gets misinterpreted it's the mums who are immunocompromised not the babies there is one drug that was put on the market I guess about three years ago called Simsia and the manufacturers actually went out of their way to say that this is safe to be taken in breastfeeding and pregnancy um, from the studies that they overtook and if I look through the standard doctor's book there's maybe only half a dozen if that um, drugs that are, are safe a 
according to the manufacturers. The manufacturers don't have to take responsibility for any drug. So that's why all the labels and all the packets that we pick up say, do not take if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. We actually discovered this morning that it actually says on hand sanitizing gel that it could get into breast milk. Um, and Amanda has picked up a question this morning that says, uh, can I use hand sanitizer if I'm breastfeeding? Think the risk of not using hand sanitizer if you're not near safe soap and water is much, much higher. Um, so th the manufacturers of Simsia actually wrote to me and said, you know, we've made this drug, we've said it's safe in breastfeeding. Uh, would you like to not promote it, but would you like to make people aware? And for a long time, I didn't do anything. Um, but then I did write a fact sheet about it because it's used for several different conditions. And actually, I want to applaud this company for putting their heads on the line and saying that it is OK. Um, and a lot of people have been taking it. The only drug that we can't use when we're breastfeeding is methotrexate. Um, methotrexate is so potent that we have to have monthly blood tests. Um, it's, it is life-saving, but it's not compatible with breastfeeding. A couple of years ago, I also wrote, a, did a poster um, for a conference, I think it was a BFI conference, looking at um, colonoscopies. Now you can imagine that with all this gut disorders, a lot of people have to have the insides of their guts looked at all of the time. Um, it's not a pleasant procedure, um, but it, it, it is necessary. So what happens is two days before the procedure, you stop eating, you're given a limited number of foods um, like jelly um, and marmite and oxo cubes that you can have, but otherwise you, you're not allowed any solid foods and you take high dose of laxatives to clear the gut out. Um, the, the laxatives actually are ones that suck water into the bowel to flush all the bowel contents out rather than being absorbed into the body and which could possibly get into breast milk. Lots of mums are told that they can't breastfeed whilst they're taking these bowel preparations, but they can. It's perfectly okay and it's a bit of a distraction. But the thing with these bowel preps is when you take them, the diarrhea that you have is very rapid onset and you need to be sitting near a toilet and you need to have access at a second's notice. There is nobody s good, somebody saying, I'll be out in a minute because out in a minute's too late. You have to have that toilet to yourself for the day. And it might be that you need to have somebody around to take the baby from you, or you might have need to have a baby seat or somewhere else that you can put them in the bathroom while you're there. Or actually you might end up breastfeeding on the toilet and careful hand hygiene afterwards. But there's no need to stop breastfeeding and lose that natural protection in there or having to pump um, the milk because you haven't got time in amongst everything else. The other thing during colonoscopies is they use a short term sedative so that you don't actually, you're not actually aware of what is going on or uh, what they're doing to you and you forget about it afterwards. My eldest daughter had one. I was sitting beside her um, when she woke up and the consultant came out and said, you know, how about you? I wrote, she goes, that's the best sleep I've had in months. She'd got a four and a half month old baby. She was a bit sleep deprived and she said, can I come back again tomorrow? Which did amuse both of us. So I did this poster about looking at how many women were told that they had to stop breastfeeding and the most common thing was that they were told to stop breastfeeding throughout the bowel prep and for 24 to 48 hours after the procedure itself. Now, three days without breastfeeding is a very long time. You're going to have some very traumatized babies, you're going to have risks of mastitis and just an interruption in everything else, which you really don't need when you're in the middle of a stressful thing to check whether your bowel is, is okay or not. Um, I 
think it's getting slightly better, but I still get at least two messages every week. So on the breastfeeding medication site, there is a fact sheet on bowel prep and there is a fact sheet on midazolam. And the BFN sh site has a uh, fact sheet all about colonoscopies. If you feel that you are interested in, in the poster and want to take a copy along to a consultant, please let me know um, and I'm happy to send you a copy. So the comments that I got when I was doing this piece of research with the Crohn's page was, my daughter won't take anything from a bottle or cup at the moment. So how are you going to manage with not breastfeeding for three days? I'm very worried if I don't feed him for two days, then my already tenuous supply would dwindle. The imaging department have been quite adamant I can't breastfeed for at least 24 hours, but they can't explain why. A lot of them are going by the manufacturer's guidelines. And as we've already said, manufacturers don't take any responsibility. I also co-sleep with my baby at night and I'm concerned Oh, to only do this safely. This is currently the only way my baby will sleep at night. That's fine. That's what babies do. If you've had sedation during the day, it's a good idea to have somebody keeping an eye on you and the baby because you may be sleeping more soundly that night. And the last per comment was, I'm not sure I want to express that much as I don't want to mess with my supply. We know if you're expressing in addition to feeding, you're going to up your supply and then you're at risk of mastitis at the other end and they're, they're not understanding the risks and benefit. The consultant I see isn't very sympathetic to me wanting to continue breastfeeding and told me I need to choose between feeding my baby and being well. Not true. You can do both of them. I will proceed without any pain relief but wondered if there might be an alternative. How brave. The, there are places that these tubes should be going. They're also inflated with air, so it feels like your, your tummy's going to explode. And you really do not want to be remembering what it feels like. I'm so worried, shall I cancel my procedure? It's been suggested that maybe I delay this until I stop breastfeeding. So actually, again, we're putting the mum at risk for, um, while we do this. When we look at research, the amount of midazolam um, that gets through into breast milk and the other ingredients that are in there, the, all the evidence from the studies is that it's insufficient justification to interrupt breastfeeding. The one piece of research said that uh, midazolam, if the baby was under, 12, uh, under two months, you should wait for four hours um, until you fed again. Now, babies under 12, two months rarely go four hours without breastfeeding, in my experience. But actually, when I traced the research back, that was where they had tried this drug as a sleeping tablet um, in a newborn on the postnatal wards. And they were measuring how long it took to get out. But if you look at the um, training pack that I've done on the way drugs get into breast milk in the first few days the gaps between the cells are wide open so all drugs go straight through there so actually giving midazolam to a two-month-old baby is very different from giving it to a 24-hour old baby so Elle said how can a mum best be supported to question her healthcare professionals if the information she's getting is incorrect I'm happy to provide you with data um, and I think the only thing that we can do is say this is the research that I've been given can you show me research that says that to breastfeed during the procedure or dr during the bowel prep or whatever is harmful you're not arguing you're preventing presenting evidence I'm very happy that any consultant or anything should be referred to me that, by email and I'm happy to have a discussion with them. Sadly, there are some who will just say, that's just how it is, that's just what our guidelines say. If you don't like it, we won't do the procedure. Other people have different ways of getting around it um, once they're home. I couldn't possibly comment on what anybody might do once they get home. Um, 
and I, it's not something I would, of course, advocate. But what I always try to do is provide evidence and information and let the mums make up their own minds, um, which I think is what uh, we've always stood by. There is a magazine uh, written by the Crohn's and Colitis um, organisation and last year they wrote um, after one of the, the page members had contacted them and they did an article about drugs and breast milk for people with IBD and they did an interview with me and they did an interview with some mums and um, on the slides there if you go and look look at it there are pictures the front cover has a picture of a 15 month old baby breastfeeding and in fact all of the mums had been feeding toddlers the magazine was put forward um, for a Scottish magazine award and it was up against covers like the Beano and Dandy and um, I'm not sure it was Hello magazine, but it was lots of, of high power magazines. But they actually won an award for the best cover of a magazine. So they w had achieved a picture with a breastfeeding mum on it. And not only a breastfeeding mum, a mum feeding a toddler in that. And it was the most amazing thing that we could have put all of these things together. And I love the clones and colitis organization for being able to do that I might actually put these um, in the comments underneath the page so that you can see them there is one study called the piano study which members of the group um, all had an input to which that um, the biological drugs did not affect growth um, infection rate or developmental milestones um, and that there wasn't any risk of um, any adverse effects at all. And that all, though the aim, agents were detectable in breast milk, they were at nanogram level and that there was no reason that they couldn't be taken by breastfeeding mother. So this is a huge, big study as well. Excuse me, I do not have any virus. But against that, one inflammatory bowel disease nurse said, we refer to the manufacturer's information. They advise it's unknown where the drugs, this drug is excreted into breast milk or absorbed systemically. Um, and therefore, um, they would not say that it, the drug could be used by a breastfeeding mum. So as I've said, the summary of project characteristics that, that that IBD nurse was going from is based on what the manufacturers say. Um, I'm hoping that sometime within the next few months there may be some changes in the way drugs are prescribed from a group that I've been part of. I'm not holding my breath. Life may change a lot for all of us in the next 12 years. Another mum who, who wanted me to share her story said, my little girl was six months exactly when I had a subtotal colectomy, so which is almost all of the bowel being uh, removed. I was an inpatient, but they gave me a side room for her, so that my daughter could stay with me because she was exclusively breastfeed, breastfed and we'd barely started solids. I had a general anaesthetic, an epidural, morphine and something for sickness. I went to theatre at midday and was back on the ward around 8pm and as soon as I was back I demanded my partner help me to get her to latch on and she was straight on. One of the things that's come up in so many different aspects of, of my work on drugs in breast milk is that actually feeding your baby helps you with pain. The oxytocin actually overrides everything else. There is one problem um, with taking these immunosuppressant drugs or another problem um, and breastfeeding is that the baby shouldn't have live vaccines. And 
the assumption seems to have been made that this is because the baby is immunocompromised and I've already said the baby is not immunocompromised the mother is so babies of mothers with IBD shouldn't be given the rotavirus vaccination in that first lot not because the baby's at risk but because the baby will shed particles of live vax virus in their poo for two weeks now the mum might pick up the rotavirus when she's changing nappies and infect herself and she's the one that's at risk the baby is at no risk at all if you want to carry on having the rotavirus then you should be wearing rubber gloves every time you change nappies for those two weeks so it's not the mum it's not the baby who is at risk it's the mum um, when we get to the MMR which is the, the uh, next live vaccine most people have had um, the MMR vaccination or be um, already be immune so the risk is far less and they, they're not shedding it in poo it is in, in um, droplets um, so that's all absolutely fine but if you have immunosuppressants in pregnancy then the risks are slightly different and it's much more complicated so if you have these biologicals um, and during pregnancy and right up to the end you should delay the live vaccines for six months but breastfeeding in itself protects against rotavirus so it's it's much less of a risk I asked the mums again what would you want me to say continuing to breastfeed can help really help mums mental health and the children and the child to cope while going through a truly awful illness and adapting to a new normal it's not always as simple as don't feed for 24 hours and there's almost always an alternative I would one would need to be in a separate building to my daughter to not feed it's a confidence and mental health when breastfeed health boost when breastfeeding works out especially when a mum has had prior health issues that women are turning to the internet and groups like this for accurate information about medication and normal behaviour. Being a mum itself can be a huge source of anxiety and couple that with being ill and then worrying whether it's safe to feed is really stressful. To support a breastfeeding mum with IBD isn't just about treating the IBD but really understanding the importance of breastfeeding and the impact of being told that you shouldn't breastfeed for 24 or 48 hours I would and still would do anything in my power to protect my babies and my grandbabies um, my daughter has had the true luck of marrying a wonderful lad whose dad also has Crohn's disease so my grandson has got the genetics coming on both sides and we have no way of knowing whether he is at greater risk because this seems very rare um, but he has been exclusively breastfed for six months um, so I hope we've done all that we possibly can to protect him the one last thing I want to leave you with it actually affects everybody but certainly affects people with inflammatory bowel disease and that's the risk of melanoma um, and skin cancer generally these immunosuppressants change our reactions in our bodies and so we are at greater risk of having skin cancers so we should be very careful about not getting sunburnt uh, two years ago now I noticed a very small mole on my heel heel and it just kind of looked like I'd stepped in some oil or something but I just had um, a melanoma removed from my nose and I said to the consultant while I'm here can you just look at that within five days I was in hospital having it removed and it turned out to be a malignant melanoma and they checked that it hadn't spread to my lymph nodes and I was very lucky that it hadn't but I was told if I'd left it for a further six months my prognosis would not have been good it started out very small became very large after the surgery and you know my feet are definitely not going to win any any award so my guts never going to fit in a bikini again my feet 
don't look so good in sandals, but what the heck, I'm still here, I'm still alive. What I would like each and every one of you to do is if you meet a breastfeeding mum with IBD, send her your empathy because life for her isn't fun. Send her to the Facebook page where she can meet other mums. When I originally set it up, it, it was just to be able to talk about poo and toilets with people who understood um, that sudden urge um, and, and everything that, that goes with it. But actually, where it's spread worldwide, it's become such an amazing group and a wonderful group of people. But tell her that breastfeeding is the best thing that she can do for her baby. Um, listen to her, because listening is the best thing that you can ever do for any mum. We all need a little bit of um, listening and support. To those of you who have IBD in the midst of all of this coronavirus at the moment, stay well. Everybody stay well. And I hope that this video has been useful to you. And if you have any questions, please let me know. If you email me on wendy at breastfeeding-and-medication.co.uk, happy to answer any questions. So have a good day. And sorry didn't meet everybody today at the conference. Bye.